I'm going to pick somebody. Okay, right there. Well, that's the problem. The problem you got with a feral cat is you've missed the socialization period. Cats have a rather narrow window. If you don't pet the kittens when they're very young, and also don't pat, stroke them, stroke them. Well, maybe what happened, the other people had chased him around and he realized you were safe. You see, this is an example of, uh, you know, the animal thinking. You know, let's say that an animal is just instinct and an animal is just, um, you know, simple associative learning like operant conditioning. Yes, operant conditioning stuff is important, but, the, but an animal can, that's an example of thinking. You know, and he realized that you were safe and so he went, he went to you. And then when it comes to the emotions, okay, let's look at where animals are similar and where animals are different. The emotional drivers in the base of the brain, they're just about the same. The difference to the person is, is you're filtering those emotions through such a big complicated computer up here that you can get a complexity of emotion. You know, animal emotions tend to be simpler. Now a dog can be growling one minute and he's wagging his tail the next minute. People hold grudges. And what do I think about using a llama for a pack animal? I don't have any problem with using an animal for a pack animal as long as you don't overload it. You don't let it get um, sores. Okay, you get into things like horse racing. I've got a lot of problems with pushing horses to where bones are snapping, lungs are bleeding, you know, because they're genetically breeding for run, 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 and then starting them too early. I have a lot of problems with biological system overload, and that's what that is. But I don't have a problem with racing a horse as long as you don't. I, you know, I, you know, at the zoo, one of the things I found there, you've got to. We don't want to let lions just, you know, kill live things. So then you got to give them other stuff to do, like you take a box of meat and put it on a cable and do giant cat toys. Tigers really like that. And then they kill a box of meat. You know, and you can move it all around and make it kind of hard for them to get it. You know, they, they, uh, but I, what you got to look at is, you know, what emotional system would be driving a behavior. Uh, yeah, you overload it, you make it too tired, you're mean to them, you know, hitting them and yelling at them. Yelling at animals is very stressful, especially animals like llamas and cattle. Screaming at them is very stressful, and they differentiate between a person screaming at them and uh, just equipment noise. And that's screaming. And this is research done by Joe Stuckey up in Canada. And what Stuckey found was that screaming at cattle made the heart rate go up more than just equipment and gate slamming. That animal knows that that screaming is directed at them. There's been a lot of stockmanship research done by Paul Hemsworth, and he has found that animals that are afraid of people give less milk, sows have less piglets, pigs gain less weight. Animals that are afraid of people are not as productive. You know, I, I mean, I feel our relationship with animals has got to be symbiotic. We've got to give them a decent life. They, they, I don't know her name, but Mrs. Nyman from Nyman Ranch, she says you've got to give them a life worth living. I really like that. I've got to make sure I, she's the one that came up with that. Elephants, chimps, dolphins. Um, I, I kind of, you know, as you go up in, in nervous system complexity, I mean, my background is trained in biology. Oyster welfare and, and scallop welfare, I don't think I'm going to have to worry about that. There's not <laughs> enough nervous system to worry about. But as the nervous system gets more complex, there's some cephalopods that have got a big brain. Uh, and it, and the brain gets more and more complex. I think the ethical things get more and more, uh, uh, we got to be more careful what we do. But when it comes to pain, all birds and mammals feel pain. And pain's nasty you know, even if you've got a small brain like a chicken. And the ultimate gold standard experiment for determining that an animal feels pain is what's called a self-medication experiment. This has been done by Culpert and, the, and I, one, one, one was done by in the chicken, the other one was done in a rat. And they artificially caused arthritis, they injected some really bad stuff into the joints there. Really messed up the joint. And then the rats had a water bottle with fentanyl, very fast acting painkiller, tastes bitter and really awful, plain water bottle. And as the leg heals, they, they, when, they, when the leg's all sore, they drink the nasty tasting stuff. Then as the leg heals, they switch to the plain water. Chickens, it was done with feed dishes with the same thing. And so birds and mammals will definitely self-medicate, definitely feel pain. And there's no question about that. Now when it gets into things like boredom and, and some of these kinds of things, uh, chickens are a lot easier to enrich than 
dolphins will move. They're more intelligent animals. The other thing is you get into a, a sensory world, a sensory emotional world. You know, animals, you know, some people say, well, the animals don't, aren't, aren't really social, but even cattle. Sisters graze together, moms and daughters graze together. Any rancher that starts using sequentially numbered ear tags will tell you, you got to come back through the chute in the same order the next year. Okay, right, right here. Okay, first of all, in autism, like we got to start what we got to start looking at age groups. Little kids, two, three, and four, you got to get at least 20, 25 hours a week of one-to-one -one teaching with an effective teacher that gets some talking, gets some interacting. When I was a little kid, you know, manners were pounded in. Uh, you got to get these kids doing stuff. Uh, there are some kids with sensory problems are so bad they'll never tolerate a big supermarket. You know, then you got to be more careful about the sensory stuff. Other kids, you keep taking them in the supermarket, they'll, you know, gradually habituate, uh, you know, then when you get into the, you see, then when you get on the high, on the older ones, the one end of the spectrum, you've got all the people that make Silicon Valley run. <laughs> and at the other end of the spectrum, you have somebody that's very, you know, going to be nonverbal and, and have to live in a supervised living situation. I'm seeing too many smart kids going down a handicap route because their abilities weren't developed. You know, my ability in art, that was really encouraged when I was a little kid. You know, I just had somebody call me. They wanted to get some of my childhood artwork, and unfortunately, I only moved three times. Things get thrown out. But you got to take the thing he's good at. A lot of these kids get fixated on something, like airplanes or trains. Teach reading with trains. Teach math with airplanes or trains. You know, if all, if all he wants to do is draw pictures of airplanes, well, let's have him draw different airports, different places the plane goes. So you're getting association back to his favorite thing, airplanes. Have you read Thinking in Pictures? Okay. I have another book called The Way I See It, too, you might find helpful. Okay, right here. If you're designing an animal shelter, you better spend some time there. Let me tell you something else that I'm finding with computer-aided design. I've been in the industry with the meat plants for 35 years. So I watched the meat plant engineering departments go from hand drafting to CAD drafting on the computer. And the old fogies, when we, they switched over, everything was fine. But I'm seeing young kids coming that have never built anything, they've never used their hands to build anything, they've never drawn by hand, make weird mistakes on drawings. They don't know where the center of a circle is. They'll put a 25-foot gate in a stockyard and not even realize it. They're not seeing their drawings right. You know, little babies learn, learn to see by touching stuff. And, and if so, someone's going to be designing an animal shelter, I think absolutely need to go to an animal shelter. This is one of the things I think is a big problem, is things are getting too abstract. If you're going to design a hospital, not just, don't just go to one hospital, go to a whole bunch of them. Talk to the people that, you know, that are using the operating room and, you know, uh, and, and get the ideas of, get those people involved. What I find with the hands-on people, like at a hospital or maybe at a feed yard, they're very good on incremental changes. Now, when it comes to something totally different, the last time I was, ah, it'll never work. A lot of times will do that. And if they just say, it will never work, I don't pay any attention to that. I got to drill into them and say, now, you got to tell me why it won't work. Don't just tell me it won't work, but why? You know, and get into the detail. Uh, well. You want to see something stupid, if you go on United Airlines and uh, find one of their old shuttle planes, shuttle by United, you get the world's dumbest galleys on those planes. They hate them. They, they ripped out perfectly good galleys with drink cards and replaced them with this idiotic dresser drawers because they were going to be like Southwest Airlines and give out drinks on the little cocktail tray. Southwest just does water, Coke, and Sprite. United does all these different drinks. They don't even have a place in it to put ice. They have to put it in multiple bags. Now, whoever designed that, a great expense. These things cost a fortune. I'd never, ever served drinks on an airplane. If they want to do it like Southwest, maybe somebody should have gone on a bunch of Southwest flights. <laughs> I, I, I'm appalled how people don't do their homework on these things. When I, well, I've done a lot of work with the various restaurant companies on their animal welfare auditing. And they'll never go to the competitor's restaurant. I call that market research. Maybe you ought to go to the competitor's restaurant and see what they're doing. 
people on, but that shuttle by United, that's, you want to see a dumb airline galley, that's it. Every time I look at that, I'm thinking, ugh. And they, well, I would recommend that, see, I'll tell you a few, let me give you a few little hints. Don't face the dog cages towards each other. That makes dogs bark when you do that. One of the biggest problems in animal shelter, and we did a paper on this, is noise. And the problem is, is that materials that absorb noise um, are hard to clean. Another thing that will cut down the barking, I tell them have volunteers come in every day and take every dog out for an hour of play and really good time every day, and then they won't get so stressed out and bark so much. But don't just don't face the dogs head to head like this. That's that's one tip that's really important. Well, design of lecture halls. Um, actually, you know, most lecture halls I've seen have been that they're usually fairly well designed. I mean, I've lectured in all kinds of in all kinds of uh, places. Um, you know, then you get into well, should it even be a lecture format? You see, then you get in, you get into that. You know that you know whether it should be, you know, and of course I'm, I, you know, that's the way I've been doing things. Maybe it's the wrong way to do stuff. One thing I do some interesting things in my design class. I have my students actually design cattle handling facilities, and I'm finding there's some big differences in the drawing skills. And I'm finding after teaching this class for 20 years that some of the kids today are having more trouble with the drawings than they did 20 years ago because they're not doing things with their hands. I'm having students coming into my class, they've never drawn a circle with a compass. They don't even know what it is. I had one girl go out and buy a Boy Scout compass. <laughs> but the thing that's a problem is Working with hands on things like when we were kids building tree houses and things like that, trying to figure out how to put up an army tent, you, have, you learn problem solving skills. And too many, you know, my class, they, there's quite a few different ways you can lay out the facility and it can be right. And then I lay out all the good drawings so they can see there's like five or six different ways to lay it out. And it's not just a total cookbook. You have to follow certain rules. And then I do an internet project where they've got to pick out a subject in animal behavior, uh, and it has to be a scientific subject, not a political one. And I make them go to, you know, like three or four different scientific databases and find journal articles. Because the thing I want to teach them is you've got to go past the first page of hats. Like, for example, if you're looking up cattle, or something with cattle, you've got to use all your keywords: cow, steer, calf, bull. You know, you've got a bunch of different words. They don't, they don't dig into the literature uh, enough. So I have a web surfing thing. And what I'm finding on that is half the students think it's a baby assignment, and the other half it's um, really a great assignment. I've had a lot of discussions in our animal science department about, you know, with other faculty that have been there for a long time, like I have. And the kind of consensus of opinion is your A student's just as good as it ever was. But the student that used to be a really nice, solid B student, B plus student, they've slipped. And one of the things I'm seeing on those, with some of these smart Asperger kids, I'm seeing some of these smart kids getting so addicted to video games, we can't get them to do anything else. You see, if, if I had gotten addicted to video games when I was in high school, I wouldn't have been out uh, doing things with horses and cattle. You know, thing, there are some kids that can learn to program games. But for every kid that's programming material, there's 10 others that are not programming material. I would have definitely been one that's not programmer material. I think one of the things is, see, an autistic person thinks in detail. See, my thinking's bottom up. It's like you take the puzzle pieces, you put them together to form the whole. And, and what you see, the normal human mind tends to drop out detail. Now, when we were living out in the bush, we never got very far away from the detail. But now, we got policymakers and stuff getting so far away from the, you might say, the nitty gritty on the ground that you know, policy gets made as more and more people that are interested in different issues want to you know, go the lawyer route. You're not figuring out how, to, how do we actually fix things. You see, I'm more of an engineering mentality. And the engineering mentality is I want to fix stuff. OK, we flunked some plants in McDonald's audit. How do I fix them without spending a lot of money? Most of them I could fix. There's some energy things that we're not going to fix with simple things. Probably some radically new technology that needs to be developed. 
Well, that's the, that's the frustration. I've had people, you said, I see things other people don't see. People say, well, how does Temple Grandin know that? Well, it's like I'm piecing together all the pictures. Like this whole BP thing, okay, let's look at that issue, the oil well. You have two issues here, deep water drilling and whether or not you should do it. That's one issue. We're not even going to discuss that. The other issue is what kind of screwed up stuff went on on this rig. I've worked on construction for 20 years. I've been, I read all the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. They dug up all the dirt, the 60-minute interview with the guy that um, told about how there was broken gasket from the blowout preventer coming up the well, showed it to the bosses. Should, they should have shut it down right then and there. They, they were cutting corners, pushing, taking safety devices off. I've been on those kind of bad jobs. Now the consequences of my jobs weren't serious as oil well, but I know exactly what went on on that. And, but I'm, I'm like getting different pictures of, of different things. They were using equipment they knew was broken. You know, it, that's called negligence. <laughs> yeah, the most critical piece of equipment in the whole world, the blowout preventer, had about three broken things on it, and they knew it. Well, that's kind of an interesting question. And I, some people probably couldn't hear it, but you were talking about, first of all, people in lots of them more in the present. Yes, I am more in the present. Um, visual thinking is a continuum, too, because some people, I, and I, I've questioned a lot of people, Everything they think about, they see specific. Then you get some people where they see the generalized steeple, but then they, I can pin them down and they'll start to see specific. Then there's some where I can't get them off the generalized one. And then there's some where it's just two lines like that. And that's all it is, just two lines. That generalized steeple has like varying degrees of detail as you move along the, along the continuum. Um, but you see, just now talking about the oil well, I'm seeing the guy now interviewed on 60 Minutes. I'm seeing um, what I imagine broken gasket to look like coming up out of the well. He didn't have a picture of that, but I know what the drill platform looks like, and I know how big around the thing is. I'm uh, imagining sort of what these things would have looked like that he would have had in his hand that he would have taken. Oh, boss, look what came up out of the well. You see, and now, based on my construction experience, I'm now back in the construction trailer with a really bad project that I was on that I won't name, where they did all these bad things. And I'm now imagining the guy I saw in 60 Minutes walking into the shipping container building they use for an office and saying, hey, boss, I'm, this is what came up out of the well. The blowout preventer's broken. And they said, keep going. You see, and I'm, you see, and I can, I'm reconstructing a picture. I know basically what an oil rig looks like. I know what the living quarters look like on it. Um, and then I may have the uh, reconstructed wrong what the gasket looks like. Well, you see, yeah, because what I'm seeing, I'm going, you see, my pictures don't come up like, you know, Google when you, when you go on that, you have like all these pictures on the screen all at once. No, mine come up like this. And then if I hold a picture, the still picture can turn it into a video if I hold it. Now, there's a lot of designers, and I've interviewed a lot of designers in the meat industry, uh, that when they look at a set of drawings for a plant, for a layout for a whole plant, they can make a still picture in their mind of the equipment, but they can't run it. I can actually run the equipment. You see, and that, that's a more extreme visual thinking. Now, if I ask them about a scene from a movie, they can replay a scene from a movie, but they can't draw a drawing for a new plant and turn on the equipment. They can see it just stationary. Now, I've had some long, long conversations about three or four of my designer friends and because I'm really interested sort of in how people think. It is a continuum. People are mixtures of you know, different kinds of thinking. And, and, and then there's some things in verbal that I kind of have kind of tape-recorded downloads. But it, it's, it's, uh, if you think very verbally, things tend to get very abstract and ideological lots of times. And a lot of ideology gets emo totally emotion driven. And they're not thinking about, well, how, when I, okay, let's take an issue like health care, for example. Um, I'm seeing hideous pictures in my mind of, the, of a guy pulling his tooth out with the pliers because he couldn't to go to a dentist. I read about that in the newspaper. So now I'm visualizing it, and it's like really hideous. I'm seeing a Ford truck driver that was being interviewed on a TV show that couldn't get medical care. Um, a girl that broke her foot and couldn't afford to go to the doctor, and you know, it's. I'm going. Well, how do we get medical care to the 
hotel maid that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, she's got really bad arthritis or, you know. You know, I'm thinking very specific things. I'm going back to that book, Nickled and Dined. That's the book that made an impression on me. Well, you know, I think the horses need, I don't like horses cooped up in stalls all the time. You know, let them get out and get horses. Get, get out, let them get out and uh, socialize. Now, if you have a horse that's been reared alone all its life, he may not get along with other horses because he never learned whether when he becomes the dominant or he doesn't, when you become dominant or you're subordinate, you just stay, you don't keep fighting. He doesn't know to stop fighting. So some animals that have been reared alone, they'll never, almost never socialize. They kill other animals. I've seen that happen with dogs. And, and sometimes the only way to get that stopped is to have an older, very well socialized, slightly, slightly bigger animal sort of knock it around a bit and put some sense into it. You know, and if you do have to keep a horse cooped up all the time, then you've got to be taking them out and riding them. You've got to do stuff with them. And you shouldn't just be feeding them pellets. Give them a lot of long hay to eat. Don't give them something that gobbles up in five minutes. Horses are designed to graze for hours and hours a day. Well, that's good. We've got to get creative on some of these things. You know, I think there's, I think there's things that we can do that we can you know, make a better environment. I don't, I don't want to see, there's two things I don't want to see. I don't want to see stereotypic behavior you know, repetitive behavior, and I don't want to see any self-injury of any kind. Those are two things that are absolutely not okay. Marine animals, I haven't done any work with marine mammals. I've read a lot about them. I saw a demonstration one time where a dolphin was trained to get a stomach tube put down it for traits. You know, they, uh, now the whole thing with a killer whale that, that killed that keeper. Now that particular whale, I found out some things about that. He, he wasn't used to people being in the water with him. And I think he was treating her almost like a toy. You know, where other, another time at SeaWorld, some teenage boys got in there and they were riding Keiko all night. And he was just fine with that. You see, this gets back on, on uh, he was used to having people in the water. You know, the USDA is saying oh, nobody should get in the water with him. Well, it's going to depend upon the whale, that particular whale. No, we don't want to get in the water with him. He's going to treat you like a toy and drown you. And then another guy got in the water with him in the middle of the night, and he ripped off his testicles. So, um, you know, this is where, where uh, you've got to look at what went on with the handling history. And, and then the whale, the free willy whale, and they let him loose. He went into a cove, and he found kids to play with, and there'd be like 50 kids crawling all over him. He wasn't eating any kids. You see, a lot of it is how, how an animal's brought up, especially a really intelligent animal like that. You learn what's food, what's not food, what's a toy, what's not. And the thing is, person up on the cement platform and in the water, that's two different file folders. And then she had this giant, big, long braid that probably resembled some other toys they had. She had a braid about that long. Okay, well, I... Uh, some, okay, horses and dogs. Some autistic kids really respond well to horseback riding therapy. I've had parents say they did their first words on a horse. So you've got rhythm and you've got balancing. Those are two things that you know in OT has seen to have a good effect on the brain. And then you've got the relationship with the animal. Some kids, a service dog is the best thing you can do. Other kids don't like dogs because they're afraid it's going to bark and hurt their ears or it smells bad. You know, so you have a situation where for one autistic kid, a service dog is the best thing you can do. For another kid, it would not be a good idea. Okay. Well, what I, well, let's look. The question was, okay, they got they're teaching to the test in the school. Well, really creative teachers can still get good grades on the test. Let's do interest. You know, write about interesting things. Uh, work mathematics into different science experiments and different hands-on things that you do. I mean, even even in art and painting, there's chemistry and making paint and you can uh, work those things into it. It makes it more real. But I'm very concerned about all the hands-on stuff being taken out of the schools. If I hadn't had art and sewing when I was in elementary school, I mean, I don't know what I would have done with myself. You know, because that was, that was making stuff. But I think that taking hands-on things, would make, we lose a lot of problem-solving skills. And then things tend to get more into, it gets back to the old thing, we're not doing stuff anymore. 
Okay, right up right there, green shirt. He predicted uh, the World Cup results was probably just chance. I mean, octopuses, um, you know, some of the cephalopods can learn by observation. They can figure out things like unscrewing a jar. Um, but the World Cup thing uh, <laughs> is probably just some random thing. I mean, you can pick out, there's an old thing about picking out stocks on the stock market. So you take the Wall Street Journal stock page, put it up on the wall, and you throw darts at it. And usually, you get just about as good a portfolio as, uh, as you do with a professional. OK, right here. OK, what, OK, what, OK, the emotional systems in the brain, that's the, if you look at it anatomically, the emotional parts of the brain, that's the parts of the same. But OK, an animal does not do higher mathematics and figure out how to fly to the moon. Well, that's complexity of emotion. You see, when you take, OK, down in the face of the brain, you've got fear, rage, separation, anxiety, um, and seeking. And then you've also got mother young nurturing, sex, and play. Now you filter these things through a big complicated cortex. You can get all kinds of complicated mixtures of emotions because you're filtering. You've got those same drivers. I mean, down here in the, the you look at the anatomy down there, it's the same, the pig as it is in a person. But then when you look at the cortex, you look at the top of the brain. So you're going through such, that, and then the whole frontal cortex, you've got you know, the whole area of the brain here. Frontal cortex, the gigantic association cortex. What frontal cortex does is associates everything in the brain with everything else. We have an association cortex that's, I don't know, 20 times bigger than any animal's got. And that, that um, then you get a complexity of emotion because you're putting it through, so, it, it, the frontal cortex is associating with everything else. And then we can, we can still do stuff. <clears throat> Animal, okay, a beaver can build a dam. But uh, one of the things that animals, they can have culture. But one thing that, that really makes technology advance is being able to write stuff down. Then the next generation can build on that knowledge. You write stuff down. Animal doesn't have any way of, uh, they, can, they can, like the elephants have a matriarch and she lives for 70 years, remembers stuff, but they can't write it down. You know, think about how much knowledge is in the library, uh, just the library at school. Or how much knowledge is on the internet. There's no way one brain could even store all that knowledge. You know, we have an ability to store knowledge that no animal has got. But when you look at, um, you know, and I, coming from like a biological background, you look at brains, I mean, they're on a, they're on a, con you know, a continuum. Like you take stuff like pain, uh, yeah, the chicken will self-medicate. Now, one of the differences is, is I, I had a friend that had a, a dog and the spay job broke and her innards came out. And the dog wasn't very concerned about it. She was looking at it and like, ooh, what's this? Now, of course, the human owner, she was horrified. And I lived out on a ranch and, you know, it was midnight on a Friday night, no way to get the vet. They, they were ranchers, so they stuffed it back in, and sewed it up the string, and, and shot her full of antibiotics, it's full of cattle antibiotics, and the dog lived. I mean, well, let's say your guts fell out. You would know how much trouble you're in <laughs> in a way that the dog doesn't. <laughs> You'd know that if your guts fell out, now that's life threatening. <laughs> Where this dog sort of going, ooh, what's this stuff? You know, coming out of here. <sighs> when I got into puberty, I had horrible anxiety attacks, and the movie showed me before I went on antidepressant medication, and it was like being in a constant state of stage fright all the time. And exercise helped it. Now I'm taking antidepressants, and that really calmed it down. But that anxiety was just absolutely awful. And I noticed cattle, when they went in the squeeze chute, they kind of relaxed. And I showed the picture of the squeeze chute. I go back to that slide. I don't know how fast I can go back on this computer without giving it a nervous breakdown. Yeah, put that, but I watched the. Let's put that picture up here. Yeah. I just watched the cattle going into a thing like this, 
And I noticed that some of the cattle, when you put them in there, they just kind of relaxed. So I built a thing I could get into and put pressure over wide parts of my body. And a lot of people find that really calming. Deep pressure on wide parts of the body are calming. And it's calming for about 20 minutes. Wouldn't be calming if you stayed in there all day. OK, let me just repeat that question. And when did people start paying attention to what I had to say? Selling the equipment was easy. I was selling equipment right from the start. But getting people to operate it correctly, that was hard. I was so frustrated. I know people would beat cattle up right in the you know, state-of-the-art facilities. Uh, and there's certain things that I've had a really hard time selling. Another one is sensory problems in autism. Problems with touch sensitivity, sound sensitivity, visual sensitivity. Some people can see flicker of fluorescent lights. A lot of people have a really hard time. Uh, they don't want to accept that. I think it's difficult, if your sensory system's normal, to imagine this alternate reality where sound hurts the ears like a dentist stroke. Or the dog would have a problem with you know, too much high-pitched noise. Uh, the sensory issues, that's been a really hard sell. Uh, there's certain things where it's, it's an easy sell, certain equipment things. Selling the equipment, actually, that was easy. Right from the beginning, I was selling the equipment. But then those cowboys put that metal plate in there, and that killed the cattle. And I, the movie didn't show the taking it out, and then it did work. They didn't end up wrecking it. But the, uh, selling the thing is easier than selling the management and getting people you know, to not be rough with cattle and other animals. You know, then gradually, you know, attitudes are changing. But there's certain th principles that are hard to sell. Like, I've been preaching for years that people on the autism spectrum for antidepressant medication have to have very, very low doses. Now, the really good doctors know, but the other doctors just follow the verbal recipe in the PDR. It says, well, you're supposed to have 20 milligrams of Prozac and bump it up to 40. They're going to do that no matter what. Then when the kid goes berserk from an overdose of Prozac, they can put them on tranquilizers to treat a Prozac overdose when they ought to be cutting the dose. People on the spectrum need a much lower dose. I've preached that for 25 years. Why, why is that a hard sell? You know, I, that, that's been a very, very hard sell. And I've had hundreds and hundreds of parents come to me and tell me about, you know, they did great on a low dose and they doubled it. It was the worst thing that ever happened. Uh, that seems like such a simple thing. But I think it's sort of like, okay, the cookbook says do this. You see, and for most people, the cookbook works. But for people on the spectrum, you get them a little dab of Prozac and be the best thing for people like me. I'm taking a very, very low starter dose of an antipressant that I've been on the same dose for 30 years. I don't dare stop taking it. I, you know, the, why, is, why is that difficult? There seem to be certain things that are difficult cells. The other thing that's a difficult sell is good stockmanship. Paul Hemsworth has maybe 35 or 40 papers on animals being afraid of humans and how that messes up productivity. Why isn't the world beating the door down for his stuff? Well, they'll buy all kinds of equipment, but they won't do the management to do the stockmanship. See, one of the things about the good stockmanship is tons of details. People want to go buy the magic new milking parlor and you know, the super duper computerized automatic takeoffs, and that's going to solve all the problems. Yes, it's nice to have good equipment. I'd, I'd much rather have the good equipment than some old crappy one. But you've also got to have the management to go with it. Some of the worst abuse of animals I've ever seen has been in state of the art facilities because they simply weren't doing the management. There's things, it, it seems like things involving a lot of details, like the thing with the medication. You see, you've got to very carefully tailor the dose, which means you have to do a lot of questioning and a lot of talking to the parents. Well, you could just put it on a sheet and also have it online that what's the sign of an overdose of SSRIs? Can't sleep, and they feel like they drank 10,000 cups of coffee. And then you cut the dose back. It's that simple. One size doesn't fit all. It's hard for hard for, I don't know why that's, to me, I don't know why that's difficult to understand. And I'm really beginning to think that it does have something to do with different ways that people think. You know, the stockmanship's a hard sell, the sensory issues are a hard sell, 
and a low dose principle, you know, and like try one drug at a time and find out what it does first. You know, you see, but you see, when I think about these things, I'm thinking about it in a very visually detailed way. I'm not just saying, oh, well, you know, you just uh, throw it at it. All right, one more question. All right, we'll take you right over there. Well, even, okay, saying, well, rodents don't need anything, then why are, why are mice uh, doing weird stereotypy somersaults at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know why they're doing it? You've got to give them places to hide. And so if you give them, like, uh, uh, they have these things called nestlets that just were sort of like those things you wipe makeup off with. And they would dig and dig and dig in these things, but they didn't weren't very satisfactory because they couldn't like get it fluffed up enough to make a place to hide. You got to give mice something to hide in. Well, they you have to look at what you have. Let's go back. Let's visualize what does it do in its natural environment. Now I'm seeing the rabbits that live in the parking lot at the Denver airport, <laughs> and they know where all the you know people throw the French fries and things out of the cars and. I, one of the things that a lot of these animals, they want a place to hide. Rabbits are, eat a lot of vegetation. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, as far as lab animals go, mice do tons of stereotypies and rats don't. But mice are much more high strung. See, there are genetic differences in animals and how well they'd adapt to a barren environment. You have an animal that's really calm and laid back, he lays around and sleeps all day, and then you've got another animal that's uh, doing all kinds of stereotypies. There's, genetic differences. But I think one of the things that will help you is what is that behavior like in the wild? Like that gerbil, think about a gerbil. I'm now seeing the desert in Arizona. And a gerbil's out there running out there among the cactus and sagebrush. And there's hawks flying around. Well, if I was a little gerbil and I didn't find a place to hide, I'd be pretty upset. Okay, well, I think we'll leave it with that. And thank you all for coming.